Hello and welcome back, Royal Family. First weekend of the month of November. The year is disappearing on us, folks. 11 3 24 is your date. November 3rd, year of our Lord 2024. Your lesson or message is a little long, but very appropriate, I believe. Again, as always, let me get settled. Finished my throat lozenger. <laughs> And yes, we will do the Lord's Supper. I apologize for not announcing it this week. I've been in some deep studies on where we're going in this Thorns uh, series, and it's really, really interesting. There's actually uh, a few things. I don't think I'll get to them today, possibly, but we'll get definitely get into them next message. That um, I don't know a lot of pastors, for me, for what I know, my lineage, that have dug any deeper into it that I'm going to dig. And I'm going to go into another level of something that I've heard before, but never really had it open fully up. And I've really been looking at the original language and the, uh, and the scriptures. Very, very interesting. It's interesting times we're living in, amen? <laughs> interesting times we're living in. Uh, what happened September 27th? A couple of things happened. I already told you our government approved of a uh, directive that the military can be on the streets. Our full-time military can be on the streets, poised against its citizens. And also the star of Jacob, first time in 3,000 years, that popped off in the sky. Um, the Hebrew New Year began in October. A lot of things happened in the last couple of months. Obviously, here in America, we're in a voting season for a president, and I don't think, as I've said before, uh, anything will be resolved for a good 60 to 90 days. So, buckle up, my personal opinion. Anyway, uh, First Thessalonians, I'm sorry, Second Thessalonians message number 141, 141, Second Thessalonians message 141. Awaken and turn back to God before the thorns of discipline entangle you. I find this a very interesting series. I've taught on thorns, I think, one time before, but I'm going in another level deeper into the doctrine of thorns. So today's title, Awaken and Turn Back to God Before the Thorns of Discipline Entangle You. That is your title, 11 3 Your date, your message number is 141, Second Thessalonians lesson or message 141. We will do the Lord's Supper at the end of the message. Again, I apologize. I didn't announce it this week. I've been very deep in study, and I went to vote early with my wife as well, so we had a lot going on. Uh, that was interesting. <laughs> I actually had to uh, fill out a second form because for some reason or other, my stuff got spit back out of the machine a couple of times, and they had to rip up my vote in front of me and put it into an envelope and give me new forms to fill out. And I found out from somebody that worked there at the early voting poll in my area, that was happening regularly. So it happened to me. It didn't happen to my wife. Very interesting. Anyhow, let us get ready to jump into it. Lord's Supper at the end, please be prepared. You can open up in the Old Testament, Isaiah 34, where we left off. Old Testament, Isaiah chapter, chapter 34 of Isaiah, where we left off. We got plenty to pray for. Obviously, here in America, we have a major, uh, a major election coming up in a couple of days, and um, I think it's going to be a time of great intensity and confusion. But we know God is in control, Amen. So we trust and rely on God. This is a great time for you to learn to apply faith, rest, and apply certain doctrines. Maybe a time to even evangelize if things get funky, like I think they're going to. So having said that, let's jump into it. Most important thing we do in the word filled by God, the Holy Spirit, because in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw his glory. Glory is the only begotten from the father, full of grace and truth. And like newborn babes long for that pure milk of the word so that by it you may grow in respect to your salvation in order to grow up, folks. We have to be in the word, Bible doctrine, the mind of Christ regularly, habitually, and filled by God, the Holy Spirit, walking in our Christ-like nature. 1 John 1, 8, 9, and 10 explains this. Believer, 1 John 1, 8, if we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves. The truth is not in us. 
1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins, cleansing us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 10. Believer, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. His word is not in us. Take a moment of silent prayer. Name and sight any known sins. Get rid of the distractions. Focus on the mind of Christ. We will pray for this lost and dying world and send a special prayer for everyone across America that they make the right decisions in the next couple of days. Every head is bowed. Every eye is closed. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time we have to come and study your word. So, Father, we are lifting up this lost and dying world once again in prayer that your word shine a light upon those unbelievers that are out there. They come to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, Father, for the lost believers that aren't accurately studying your word and walking the right way, that they wake up and return before they are tangled up in the thorns and thistles. So, Father, we're praying for one another. We're praying for this lost and dying world. And, Father, I'm lifting up this little congregation in prayer. They keep going forward and, 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 and growing, maybe at a slow pace. But, Father, we are growing slowly and moving forward. And our impact is increasing. Books are going out. The word is going out. The platforms that are the videos are going on are being viewed. So, Father, we are grateful and thankful. And I ask that you protect these believers that support these type of ministries that are simply trying to get your word out there, grace-based, non-denominational ministries, preaching the word accurately. So, Father, I'm praying for my congregation, and I'm praying that the next couple of days here in America, people make the right decisions, Father, and that there is no corruption. And if there is corruption, if there are lies, if there is trickery, Father, which we know this is Satan's world, but if there are lies, confusions, and trickery, Father, that they get exposed so we know what to do and how to handle these situations. And no matter what happens, Father, I'm praying for those positive believers, those serious believers, to begin to apply all the things they've learned in your word in the mind of Christ and learn to apply walking in the new nature, not panicking in the flesh, but being strong examples and leaders within their circle of family and friends. Father, I pray for all these things through your son's precious name. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us jump into it, royal family. Lord's Supper at the end, please be prepared. You guys should be opening back up in Isaiah, Old Testament, chapter 34. <clears throat> now, as I told you before, this was Isaiah warning of the coming march of the Assyrian Empire. And upon the northern and then the southern tribe of Israel... He, obviously Isaiah, being a prophet of the southern tribe, was saying, listen, the things are going to start falling into place. The northern tribe's going to be overrun. We're going to be overrun, the southern tribe. So he's giving the warnings. He's teaching the doctrine. He's prophesizing. And the message from most of God's prophets in the Old Testament is, believers, turn, repent, turn back. Unbelievers, come to the truth. Because once saved, always saved. But most of the prophets in the Old Testament were there to call God's people back to walk with God. They were already born again and saved, but they are walking away from God's plan instead of in God's plan. It holds several layers of prophecy within it. First, the Assyrians would march upon both kingdoms. And later, the Babylonians would follow and do the same exact thing. So there's a lot of layers of this prophecy, as almost all prophecies have multi-layers. The true and clear picture here, though, I explain this to you, the true and clear picture here points us right into the seven years of tribulation yet to come. So as you get through the layers of prophecy about the Assyrians and Babylonians, you realize it's really pointing very far ahead into the seven years of tribulation. Isaiah 34, 1, and it's a call to the whole world, the whole world, not just Israel. Come near, you nations, plural, to hear and listen, you peoples, plural, everyone. Let the earth itself and all it contains hear what I'm saying, says the Lord through the prophet Isaiah. And the world and all that springs from it, Isaiah 34, 2. For the Lord's anger is against all nations, 
rebellion across the world, and his wrath against all armies, rebellion across the world, certainly seven years of tribulation. He has utterly destroyed them. That's never happened across this world yet. He has turned them over to slaughter. Isaiah 34, 3. Now, I can tell you during the Assyrian and then Babylonian empires, these things happened on a smaller scale, but this is pointing to a very large scale sometime in the future. Isaiah 34, 3. So their slain will be thrown out, their corpses will give off their stench, and the mountains will be drenched with their blood. Very descriptive, folks. This is all written in a future tense, pointing us to a time, really, when you get through the layers of prophecy of the Assyrians and Babylonians, future tense, pointing us to a time at the end of the tribulation period, seven years yet to come after the rapture, the battle of Armageddon and the second advent of Christ. The second advent of Christ at the end of the seven years. A lot of people don't understand eschatology, end time doctrine. When Christ returns as the warrior king, I can't emphasize that enough. Because we can look back on General Patton here in America. We can look back on the different uh, historic battles and say, boy, America went in there as warriors and we laid waste and all these wonderful things you can say about how strong your military is. And I can tell you, there is one warrior king yet to step down a second time, Jesus Christ, who's going to have the highest body count. When Christ returns as the warrior king, it is not a time of peace, love, and mercy. It is not. The earth itself will shift on its axis once again as it did at the flood. It will be a supernatural set of events leading up to the day the Lord Jesus Christ steps down on the Mount of Olives. This is why you don't even want your worst enemy to be walking on this earth during the seven years of tribulation, specifically the last three years or so. <clears throat> Isaiah 34.4 and all the heavenly lights will wear away, and the sky will be rolled up like a scroll. Never happened, folks. Yet to come, all its lights will also wither away as a leaf withers from the vine or as one withers from a fig tree. Interesting, often uh, Israel is referenced as what we would say olive trees or fig trees, believers in, in Israel in particular. But the second advent of Christ is marked by a supernatural set of events like never before, which culminates at the Battle of Armageddon. You can read that in Matthew chapter 24, Mark chapter 13, Acts chapter 2. Mark those down and look and line them up. Scripture interprets Scripture. Scripture interprets Scripture. Matthew chapter 24, Mark chapter 13, Acts chapter 2. All of those will point to exactly what this is all about. It has never happened. So for those so-called prophets and teachers online saying, we're entering a tribulation right now. It's not the one you're thinking. It may be a turbulent time. And there are times the word tribulation in the Bible simply means challenges and attacks are coming. But not the tribulation, capital T, seven years yet to come. We're not in it. The second advent of Christ is marked by all supernatural events like never before seen culminated at the Battle of Armageddon. Again, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Acts chapter 2. The three years leading up to this battle will be hell on earth. Best description I can give you. I don't teach to children. The three years leading up to this battle will be hell on earth. It will not be pleasant. You won't wish it on your worst enemy if you're a true Christian. Trust me. Isaiah 34, 5. For my sword has drunk its fill in the heaven. In other words, it's filled, it's ready to go. Says the warrior king. Behold, it shall descend for judgment upon Edom and upon the people whom I've designated for destruction. Pleasant words from our Lord, really, when it comes down to it. My sword is full of righteousness, the righteousness of heaven. God's justice is going to be unveiled. My sword is full of righteousness, the righteousness of heaven. That's what it means. It will be used to begin the judgment upon the enemies of the cross. 
seeds of Satan and unbelievers. Notice what I'm saying. The sword of heaven, full of righteousness, is already ready. It's going to be sitting on ready. It will be used to begin the judgment upon enemies of the cross, seeds of Satan and unbelievers. The completion will be at the end of the thousand-year reign of Christ on earth at the great white throne judgment. But the harsh part of the, of the judgment starts at the end of the seven-year tribulation. You'll see it. But I can tell you it will end at the thousand-year reign of Christ on earth at the great white throne judgment. And that will be for all the seeds of Satan and the unbelievers. Now, Edom, many of you know, but if you don't, you've never heard this before, pay attention. This is accurate theology I'm trying to teach you. Edom points to descendants of Esau, Jacob and Esau, descendants of Esau, yet it was always used for the polar opposite of the people of God. That's how it's used in good theology. So when you talk about Edom, you're obviously talking about unbelievers. Polar opposite of the people of God. What we would say is the antithesis of Israel. The exact opposite. A common enemy living in the same land. Edom and Israel. A common enemy living in the same land. Jacob and Esau are under the same tent. Believer or unbeliever. Tears among the wheat. Sound familiar? I kind of harped on that at the beginning of the year again. Tears among the wheat. Look at what Isaac told Esau after the birthright was given to Jacob. Now, Jacob did it very shady. Mommy helped Jacob. Jacob was a little bit of a mama's boy. Look at Genesis 27, 39 on the board. 39 through 40. Genesis 27, 39. I put it on the board for you. <clears throat> this is a reminder what happened between Jacob and Esau. Genesis 27, 39. Then his father Isaac answered and said to him, Now remember, Isaac is old, he's half blind, he's ready to go home to be with the Lord. And then his father Isaac answered and said to him, Behold, away from the fertility of the earth, Esau, shall be your dwelling, and away from the dew of the heaven from above, verse 40, and by your sword, Esau, your own power, your own strength, your own temperament, by your sword you shall live, and you shall serve your brother Jacob, but it shall come about when you become restless that you will break his yoke from your neck. In other words, it won't last. You won't stay under his authority. That's in the Bible. All of Esau's blessings came by his own hand. All of Esau, Edom, unbelievers, the world, all of Esau's blessings came by his own hand. He became wealthy or prosperous. You can see that in the Bible. He became wealthy or prosperous, but it's very symbolic. And pay attention to me here. Esau's prosperity by his own hand, very symbolic of God allowing unbelievers to taste a blessing on earth, yet they never reach the eternal blessing of heaven. So never look at your neighbor, your cousin, your co-worker that refuses to believe upon Christ and scoffs and laughs at you, and yet they have a nicer house than you. Maybe they have a nicer car or a bigger bank account. I'm telling you, it is by their own power. They're being blessed, and it may be God allowing certain things. It may be Satan blessing them, but Esau became wealthy or prosperous, but it's very symbolic of God allowing unbelievers a taste of blessing on earth, yet they never reach the eternal blessings of heaven. So be careful how you judge the temporal. Folks, this is a drop in the bucket. The 80 or 90 years you may be here is a drop in the bucket. Esau was an unbeliever, and the descendants of Edom from Esau's bloodline often represented the unbelievers in theology. Unbelievers living side by side with believers, and in the end, they will never receive an eternal blessing from God. Let me say that again. We talked about tares among the wheat. I told you that parable has a lot of meanings to it. Obviously, end time eschatology there. But the tares among the wheat are something we can see coming right out of the garden with Cain and Abel. Tears among the wheat means the unbelievers and believers living side by side. And often the tares, the unbelievers, are trying to strangle out the healthy wheat, the believer. 
unbelievers living side by side with believers. And in the end, it seems like they're, they're winning sometimes, but in the end, they will never receive an eternal blessing from God, period, if they remain unbelievers. God, in his boundless mercy and grace, allows blessings in the temporal. He allows it, his permissive will. He allows blessings in the temporal for those who follow simple doctrinal principles such as personal responsibility. Did you know that? I've taught it before. Such as hard work, following laws of divine establishment, being a responsible, hard-working citizen, following the rules and the laws of the land. There's prosperity in that for even an unbeliever. Keep in mind, though, Satan can also bless people in the temporal. Let me say this again. I've taught this before. It's very biblical. Esau is a great example. God, in his boundless mercy and grace, allows blessings in the temporal for those who follow simple doctrinal principles such as responsibility, taking personal responsibility, such as hard work or following the laws of divine establishment. There's blessing in that for believer or unbeliever. But also we keep in mind, Satan also can bless people in the temporal. Many unbelievers have all their blessings in time, yet in the end, they will face an everlasting misery in the lake of fire. Nothing you should ever uh, wish upon your worst enemy. If you do, you have a, a, an illness in your soul, Christian. Well, I can't wait for my enemy, my neighbor who hates God and who I've argued with over the years, I can't wait for them to be in the lake of fire. You better check your soul structure believer. There's an illness in there. You are either not born again and saved, or you have a root of bitterness, and you better take care of that. Many unbelievers have all their blessings in time, yet in the end, they will face an everlasting misery in the lake of fire. Unbelievers who oftentimes, reality of this world we live in, unbelievers who oftentimes attack and bring misery into the life of believers is referenced as Edom in many scriptures. Polar opposite of believers, and often they are a thorn that attack believers. Edom, Esau. Esau took two wives, Canaanites. He was never a believer. He never followed the word of God. Esau took two wives, Canaanite wives, that followed and worshipped Baal. He was dependent upon his own power and could care less about blessings or birthright. That's seen in scripture. Jacob, this is funny now, this is why we never judge a book by its cover. Jacob achieved the birthright by manipulation and trickery with mommy. Think about that. And Jacob and Esau, when this happened, were grown men. They were grown men. Many believe they were between the age of 40 and, and uh, 80 years old. Jacob achieved the birthright by manipulation and trickery with mommy. Yet he was the true believer. How do you explain that? Esau was not. Jacob was the true believer, manipulating and tricky. And, and Jacob spent most of his life being very manipulative and tricky. He's what you call a supplanter. He came out of the womb as the younger one. He was hanging on to Esau's heel on the way out of the womb. He was dragged along by hanging on to Esau's heel, and he always was finding a way to slip in the back door and get deals done. Jacob achieved the birthright by manipulation and trickery, yet he's the true believer. Esau was not. God knew Isaac may have favored Esau, and Scripture points to that. That their father Isaac probably favored Esau, mommy favored Jacob. God knew Isaac may have favored Esau, yet Esau would always be the unbeliever. Therefore, the blessings and birthright had to go to the believer. It didn't matter that protocol meant the older son, even if he was born a second before. They were considered twins, but yet they had different um, complexions and different things about them that were different. Obviously, Esau was the hairier of the two because Jacob had to put on goat skins to fool his dad, who was half blind, really. 
pretty much full, full blind and had to feel who the, the son was he was blessing. So therefore, the blessings at birthright had to go to the believer. So be careful how you judge the plan of God or judge another believer. It's a great life lesson, folks, about people we think are good or going to heaven, what we think, when in the end we find out differently. How many times have you judged somebody or a situation and a year goes by, nine, month, nine months or five years go by, and you look back and go, wow, I was wrong about that. It's a good life lesson here about people we think are good or they're going to heaven, when in the end we find out differently. A lesson on never judging a book by its cover. God's ways and man's ways, two different ways. God's thoughts and man's thoughts, two different thoughts. Esau did not care about the blessings or birthright, if you know the story. It's not our lesson today. But Esau did not care about the blessings and birthright until his younger brother Jacob received them. He didn't care less about them. He, he threw it all in for a bowl of lentil stew that Jacob was so good at cooking. Esau didn't care about the blessings. Didn't care about birthrights until his younger brother Jacob received them. Pettiness, jealousy. Then his true nature of bitterness and jealousy and pettiness erupted. Then he really hated his brother. Now, keep in mind, most of this we're looking at in Isaiah 34 is really pertinent about the seven years of tribulation. But we have to look at that, that uh, title we say, Edom in theology, and realize it comes from the bloodline of Esau. And Esau and Jacob are like the wheat and the tares. Very interesting principle, which means during the seven-year tribulation, those that come to finally believe upon Christ are going to be in a very difficult situation, a lot of Edom around them. So Isaiah 34 is really pertinent about the seven years of tribulation because the people of Edom never amounted to a larger culture, really, and actually they vanished in the history books. It's hard to find them. Edom then points to unbelievers who have trusted in their own power and their own religious system, and they've gone the way of Satan, really, more or less. So the dual meaning you're looking at here, the dual meaning within this is that the Assyrians and then later the Babylonians would either destroy or incorporate all these other tribes into their ranks. That happened a lot. So there are some that believe a lot of the Edomites eventually got sucked into the Babylonian culture because they were already unbelievers. They were already worshiping certain fallen angel gods and therefore being sucked into the Babylonian culture was just natural for them. That's where they most of them disappeared, probably. Isaiah 34, 6. Look at verse 6. I didn't want to get sidetracked, but some people ask, why is Edom brought up there? I just explained it to you. Isaiah 34, 6. The sword of the Lord is filled with blood. Sounds pretty graphic. It drips with fat, with the blood of lambs and goats, with the fat of the kidneys of the rams. For the Lord has a sacrifice in Boz Bozrah, in the Hebrew, and a great slaughter in the land of Edom. That's why you need to understand these principles, where they came from. All sin must be atoned for with sacrificial blood. You can look at Genesis chapter 3. The standard is set. Exodus chapter 12, especially verse 1 through about 13. Leviticus chapter 4, 1 through 12. Isaiah 53. All of those show us the justice system of God in eternity past already ordain the fact that all sin must be atoned with sacrificial blood. And we know it's only the true Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, that takes away the sins of the world. But those sacrificial animals in the ancient times were all pointing forward to, you better believe on the Messiah. He's coming, and this is what's going to happen. All sin must be atoned for with sacrificial blood. Genesis chapter 3. Exodus 12, Leviticus 4, Isaiah 53. Those who reject the sacrifices of Christ 
will forfeit their own lives as sacrifices to God's justice system in the end, really, when we look at it, the big picture. God cannot go back on his own righteousness, his own justice. I told you there are things God cannot do. So when we look at those believers who continually reject the Edoms of the world, who continually reject the sacrifice of Christ, they're going to forfeit their own lives as a form of sacrifice in the end. They're going to stand on what they believe is righteousness in the end. And God's justice system has already spoken. It was only satisfied through the person and work of Jesus Christ. So God cannot go back on his own righteousness, his own justice. Several things God cannot do. I've taught this many times. Several things God cannot do. He can't go back on his own justice, his own righteous. And one is he cannot lie. God cannot lie. Another is he cannot remove a promise or a legal standard he already established. He cannot lie. He cannot remove a promise or a legal standard he already established. After all of Abraham's and David's failures and all the different failures of Israel, why weren't the promises ever removed? Why didn't they lose their salvation? They didn't. Because God can't go back on those things. He can't lie. He can't go back and remove promises or a legal standard he already established. Another thing he can't do, he can never recreate himself. He can't recreate himself. There's only one unique triune God. And my wife and I were talking about this the other day. A lot of people, it's hard to wrap our finite minds around the fact that we have one God that operates in three separate beings. But it's all one God. All one God operating in three separate beings. The pre-incarnate Christ, we say pre-incarnate because he hadn't become human yet, is seen in the Old Testament. He walked in the garden of the cool of the day. He wrestled with Jacob. He stood in front of Joshua as the leader of the spiritual military army. That's the pre-incarnate Christ. He appeared many times. He appeared in front of Jacob with angels that he sent to Sodom and Gomorrah. Same Christ that went to the cross, but he wasn't human at that point. Our triune God, folks, can't recreate himself. There's only one unique triune God. Born-again believers can never come under judgment at the final great white throne judgment, I tell you, the Bema Seat judgment of Christ is different than the great white throne judgment. The Bema Seat judgment of Christ is for church age believers after the rapture. It's the time when you're going to answer for what did you do with the time, talent, treasure I gave you? Is it going to become precious stones under the Bema Seat, the hot light, or is it going to be wood, hay, and straw? But the great white throne judgment, you're removed from that, believer. Born-again believers never come under judgment at the great white throne judgment. We will witness it. I believe that. We will witness it. We will not participate in it. We will. Everybody will witness it. Because the world that we know it is going to supernaturally change, not only at the end of the tribulation, but I can tell you at the end of the thousand-year reign when really eternity begins at that point in a supernatural way, everybody will witness the great white throne judgment. Believers will not participate in it. Not that I know of. <laughs> not what Scripture teach me. So the sword we're looking at here in Isaiah 34, the sword in the hand of God, Jesus Christ, is reference to his divine justice system. The word of God, Jesus Christ, is a sword of justice as well. Think about that. That's used in Scripture as well. The Word of God, Jesus Christ. Who's the Word? The Word became flesh. The Word was in the beginning. The Word of God, Jesus Christ, is a sword of justice as well. So Edomites, Moabites, Mosquito Bites, all of these different mites and bites we see in the Old Testament. Edomites and Moabites in particular had a stronghold or a capital city known as Bozra. It's about on the eastern border, border of Israel. I forgot how far away from the eastern border of Israel it is on, on modern day maps. But Edomites and Moabites had a stronghold or a capital city known as Bozra, eastern border of Israel. So this speaks to any military 
or fleshly strongholds that they will not withstand the justice of God in the end. Certainly at the end of the tribulation, because we have to keep touching back to the coming tribulation, because this prophecy has layers to it. So it's not only talking about the time Isaiah was, was living, when the uh, Assyrians were coming, and then hundreds of years later the Babylonians would come, it was pointing to the tribulation. So this speaks to any military or fleshly strongholds. They will not withstand the justice of God in the end. Certainly at the end of the tribulation, second advent of Christ. The Moabites, many of you know, and if you don't, here's a quick history lesson. The Moabites were from the wicked copulation of Lot and his daughters, actually one daughter, and the Ammonites, here's another one, came from Lot copulating with his youngest daughter. Moab came from the oldest daughter. Because Lot decided he was going to live in the cities of sin, Sodom and Gomorrah, and he allowed his children to be raised there. So when they were rescued, when they were raptured out, they were raptured out of the city, his wife looked back because she liked that lifestyle, may have been an unbeliever. She turned into a pillar of salt, but Lot and his two daughters got out of there. But you can see what living in sin, even as a believer, causes. The Moabites came from, and again, I don't teach to children. The Moabites came from the wicked copulation of Lot and his daughter. The Ammonites came from Lot copulating with the youngest daughter. And the Moabites, we would say Moab, came from the oldest daughter sexual encounter with daddy. Interestingly enough, there is some historic evidence that Moabites and Edomites even did have ample opportunities to believe upon the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Many of you know Ruth. Many of the women like to read the book of Ruth. Ruth was originally a Moabite. That's her bloodline. Anybody can become born again and saved. Amen? In fact, I've taught you this past year that tribes... Tribes and kingdoms of truly wicked people who are probably in the line, bloodline of Nimrod and Cain, seeds of Satan, I call them, were offered salvation. They were offered salvation. Some may disagree with this teaching, but I find it backed up by a handful of scriptures. And it makes sense to me that they were offered salvation. Anyone offered salvation. I showed you this already, but just go over quickly with me. Colossians 3, 10, and 11 on, on the board. Colossians 3, 10, and 11. So if this message is touching somebody that's been really involved in evil, you still have an opportunity before your last breath to come to Christ. Now, you may have missed out on crowns, blessings, and rewards, and there may be discipline in your life because of decisions. But you can be born again and saved. I believe that's what the Bible teaches. Colossians 3.10. And have put on the new self, the Apostle Paul says. What did we do at the beginning of the message? We named in sight sin. Which means you're taking off the old nature, making a free will decision. Take off the old, put on the new. Colossians 3.10. And the Apostle Paul writes. And have put on the new self, which is being renewed continually. To a true knowledge, Bible doctrine according to the image of the one who created it, we are to become more Christ-like. He must increase, we must decrease. Colossians 3.11. A renewal, pay attention here, I taught this this year, a renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised. The reason when Paul does these listing of all these different things, it's because he's he's... He's stopping the argument, but what about this? But what about this one? But what about that? That's why he lists all these things. Verse 11, Colossians 3.11, a renewal in which there's no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, and that covers a lot of evil groups, barbarian or Scythian. I showed you that group, Scythian. I taught you on one of the few pastors 
who taught, taught on the Khazarian Mafia in recent years, I think. Barbarian or Scythian, slave and free. But Christ is all and in all if you believe. If you believe. Maybe this message reaches somebody in death row in a prison and they did a heinous crime. I'm telling you, and I'm, and I'm willing to back it up, that you can believe upon Christ and enter heaven. Now, I won't lie to you and tell you there's not still discipline or loss of crowns, blessings, and rewards, but you can be in heaven. This is my personal belief, but I believe no one is beyond the saving reach of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I think that's what the Bible teaches. And I hear a lot of amens out there, and the men in my lineage would teach the same thing. No one is beyond the saving reach of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I think those who take the mark of the beast now, if we talk about this, different dispensation, different time, because the seven-year tribulation is really not a dispensation. It's a time in history owed. So I think, from what I can tell, the church age we're in, no one is beyond the saving reach of the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, in the Old Testament, no one would be on the saving reach of the Lord Jesus Christ, especially after the flood. So I think those who take the mark of the beast now in the seven years of tribulation, they will be beyond reach. Scripture is pretty definitive about that. Once the seven-year tribulation hits, if they take the mark of the beast, they're beyond reach. But no one after the flood and before the rapture is beyond salvation. No one after the flood and before the rapture is beyond salvation if they truly believe upon Jesus Christ. Not our lesson today, but these were important points. Listen to me carefully again. In the seven years of tribulation, those who take the mark of the beast, I believe, from what the Bible teaches us, are beyond reach of salvation. But no one after the flood and before the rapture is beyond salvation if they truly believe upon Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Isaiah 34, 7. Look at verse 7. I'm going to get into some interesting principles here before the Lord's Supper and next message, you should tune in. If you, you, There's some principles here we're going to look at that have never really been dug up that I know of um, in recent years. Let's put it that way. And by that, I mean in a long time. Isaiah 34, 7. Wild oxen, now pay attention to this, rahim, rahim in the Hebrew, wild oxen will also fall with them and young bulls with strong ones, so their land will be soaked with blood. Future tense, soaked with blood means it's everywhere, and it will be. Second Advent. And their dust becomes greasy with fat. Animal sacrifice, pay attention here, if you know anything about Levitical sacrifice, animal sacrifice would never involve a tainted animal or a wild ox would never involve a tainted animal. In other words, an animal with spots or defects because it's representing Christ. Animal sacrifice would never involve a tainted animal or a wild ox. This is pointing to something beyond a Levitical sacrifice. First clue. This is pointing to something beyond a Levitical sacrifice. Rahim in the Hebrew is it actually comes from an Aramaic root word, usually meaning a type of extinct buffalo or an aggressive large wild oxen, sometimes called by some scholars, not me, a unicorn. You heard me right. Rahim, when you study, you've got to really get into it. There's a couple of words we're going to get into between today and next message that I can tell you right now, it took me three hours, just a few words, to really look into some history. Rahim is from an Aramaic root word, usually meaning a type of extinct, large, wild buffalo oxen, 
or an aggressive wild type of oxen, sometimes used as a unicorn, meaning a horse type creature with horns. This is a very graphic and violent description of whole cultures of people being wiped out. This meaning of blood-soaked mountains, blood-soaked land, and the reference to the dust becoming greasy fat speaks to prosperity turned into ashes. And also, this description of this odd animal leaves you to wonder about what may be in the future. This is a very graphic and violent description here, folks. I'd be a liar to tell you different. Whole cultures of people being wiped out. By who? Jesus Christ. This meaning of blood-soaked mountains, blood-soaked land, and the reference to the dust becoming greasy fat speaks to prosperity turned into ashes. This means that at that historic point in the future, no amount of wealth, human power, or strength, or any oddity that is created, leave your own imagination. This means that at the historic point in the future, no amount of wealth, human power, or strength, or any oddity which is created will be left standing once the justice of God wipes the world clean at the second advent. Won't be standing. It's very clear when the Lord Jesus Christ returns at the Battle of Armageddon, it is first and foremost as the most fierce warrior known to mankind. Nothing will withstand. Nothing man can create or Satan and man together can create will stand. So, I'm not going to get into a lot of details, but there are people believe in things called, uh, what they call trail cams, where you see things that are called skinwalkers or Bigfoot or aliens or creatures. I will tell you from my personal studies, demonic creatures, Nephilim, from before the flood, disembodied demons, they're called, can go into a lot of things and they can copulate and make a lot of things Satan wants to create. So there may be some things out there that people have seen that we shouldn't laugh at and say, well, that was just their imagination. But I can tell you, they won't stand the time when Jesus Christ returns with a sword. They will not stand. Revelation 19, 13. Take a look at this on the board. Most fierce warrior, he will wipe it all clean. Anything Satan thinks he can create or man can create. Revelation 19, 13 through 15 on the board. Scripture interprets scripture. Revelation 19, 13. He, Christ, is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, his sacrifice, but also dual meaning what he's going to be bringing. And his name is called the Word of God, Jesus Christ. Revelation 19, 14. And the armies which are in heaven, winter, winter believers, with angels, that's us. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. There are hints that there are animals in heaven. We're following him on white horses, Revelation 19, 15, from his mouth comes a sharp sword, Jesus Christ, so that with it he may strike down the nations, plural. The whole world will feel this. All those who receive the mark, all the unbelievers, all the satanic, demonic beings will feel a strike. And he will rule them with a rod of iron, and he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God. What happens to grapes in a wine press? They're smashed and they pop. And their juices and fat and blood go everywhere. Sound familiar? Isaiah 34. The fierce wrath of God the Almighty. That aligns with scripture right there. That's what I'm talking about. That's what Isaiah is talking about. Even though he didn't realize the depth of the prophecy he was talking about. Isaiah 34, 8. Look at Isaiah 34, 8. 
We're going to have to wrap it up here soon and do the Lord's Supper. There's a lot of good stuff here, folks. Took me hours to dig through. Isaiah 34, 8. For the Lord has a day of vengeance. In other words, it's coming. A year of retribution for the cause of Zion. Meaning what? This has to do with Israel, obviously. But the last year, I'm telling you, of the seven years of tribulation will see horrific destruction. That's what I believe, and there are some other scholars from many, many years ago. Some of the stuff I studied was written well over 100 years ago. The last year of the seven years of tribulation will see a horrific destruction on earth. That's what I believe this points to. Folks, and I've taught this before, and it's in the Bible. There will be ecological disasters, meaning across the earth. There will be ecological, 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 however you want to pronounce it, ecological disasters before Jesus Christ returns at the end of the Great Tribulation. One-third of the Earth's vegetation, one-third of the oceans, and one-third of fresh waters will be destroyed and unusable. So says the Word of God, not Pastor Rick. Revelations chapters 8 through 16 cover this in great detail. I'm going to say that again, and you guys can get ready to start preparing for the Lord's Supper. We're going to get ready to wrap this up today. I thought I was going to get further, but there's too much good stuff here, folks, for us to rush. There will be, and I believe it really points to the last year of the three and a half year mark of the tribulation. There will be ecological ecological disasters. This all has to do with the bold judgments and all the judgments written about in Revelation. There'll be ecological, ecological disasters before Jesus Christ returns at the end of the Great Tribulation. One-third of the Earth's vegetation, one-third of the oceans, one-third of the fresh waters will be destroyed and unusable Revelation chapters 8 through 16. So anybody telling you you're in the tribulation now, then definitely they're telling you, I guess, that you're in the early stages. But even that doesn't align. Because the early stages of the tribulation are the rise of the Antichrist. Just a, uh, some food for thought. And the rebuilding of the Temple of Jerusalem. A lot of things. Peace deals. All kinds of things. So Revelation chapter 8 through 16 covers all of this in great detail, what I'm showing you, the destruction during, and especially during, I think it's the last year of the tribulation. So the ignition point of real chaos and destruction will happen at the three and a half year mark of the tribulation when Satan appears in physical form trying to be God and the abomination of desolation stands in the temple. Many of you know your Bible. Three and a half year mark, the ignition point of all the real chaos and destruction and the judgments cracking open in the heavens will happen at the three and a half year mark of the tribulation when Satan appears in physical form and the abomination of desolation stands in the temple. Many of you know your Bible. Realize this. And I tell you, it is coming, but it is not here yet. So be careful about people telling you that they know we are in dead center in the tribulation. And be careful about people telling you about human messiahs on the landscape, because I'm telling you, they are not. It is a lie. There is a rapture of the church, there is a seven-year period, and there are definitely markings that are easy to look at and say, we're not there yet. We are supposed to grow up and have the spiritual discernment to align biblical scripture and the Bible up with historical context and look on the landscape ahead of you and say, we're probably this place over here. But nobody knows exact times. Nobody knows exact dates. And for that matter, nobody knows the exact persons that will come into power because there's going to be a unholy trinity and it will start with probably an antichrist or the false prophet right around the same time. I think the false prophet will start to pop up really shortly after the antichrist comes on the landscape 
and start to point to the Antichrist as being a Messiah. And then the three and a half year mark, Satan will appear, abomination of desolation, as a God himself, what he's always wanted to be. So, having said that, we are going to prepare for the Lord's Supper. As we've been studying this doctrine of thorns, we must never forget it is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who received our thorns and thistles, our sins, our mistakes, and failures fell upon him. Thorns, royal family, points to the struggle of the cosmic system, which is opposed against the things of God. Everything in the cosmic system is really a typology of thorns and thistles we get tangled up in. And thorns points to the struggle of the cosmic system, which is opposed against the things of God. Thorns points to our sins and decisions from the flesh. The things we do that kick against the truth of God are the thorns we get stuck with and the thistles we're tangled in. The thorns points to misery and discipline. We're seeing that in this series. Thorns speak to negative decisions toward God. You're seeing that in this series. Thorns are related to a curse and a pain. Yet our Lord Jesus Christ received the crown of thorns pressed and dug into his scalp. He received the punches and slaps and humiliation for us. It was his backside that received the skin ripping lashes from the back of his shoulders down to the back of his thighs. It was his backside that received the skin lip ripping lashes directed toward us. Jesus received the curse. The crown is symbolic. Jesus received the curse. He received the pain. He received the discipline we should have received. So if you never understood this before, never believed upon Christ, you are born in sin and therefore depraved. And you have to look to the cross, the person and work of Jesus Christ. And in your heart, realize I'm a sinner. I need a savior. He is it. Because he received it all for us. Jesus received the curse. He received the pain and discipline we should have received. Our sins and curse fell upon him. On the night our Lord was so bitterly betrayed, he took the bread, he broke it, and raised it up, giving thanks, saying, this is my body I give to you, take and eat. In remembrance of our Lord, let us eat the bread. In the same manner, our Lord lifted the cup, giving thanks again, saying, This is the cup of a new covenant in my blood. Each time you eat the bread and drink the cup, you bring me into remembrance until I return. Let us drink the cup. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time we have to come and study your word and partake of the Lord's Supper. And Father, we're praying for this lost and dying world and we're keeping America in our prayers during this confusing and volatile time heading into a presidential election that seems to be so thick with deception, Father. So we're praying for the right guidance and we're praying to be strong enough to handle these things. And we're just grateful for all you have done for us. And it's through your son's precious name, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen.